Hey everybody, this is Mr. Mazzoro, and today we're going to start talking about marine science. And we're going to start off kind of basic. We're going to start talking about the oceans, and specifically what they look like today, how they've changed over time, and how they get there to begin with. So, we'll start talking about how water got in the oceans. Were, they, were the oceans always filled with water? And, and if not, then when they weren't filled with water and they are filled with water, how do those trillions and trillions of gallons end up in the ocean? That's the first thing that we'll discuss. And then we're going to go on and talk about what the oceans look like today, how many they are, why they're oceans and not seas, and that sort of thing. And, and then we'll go into, once we understand what the oceans look like today, we'll start talking about what they've looked like over time. Have they always looked like that? Are they still changing? How? That's what we're going to do in this lesson. So let's start it off. So how did liquid water get on Earth? Well, there's actually two theories about this. For a very, very long time, marine scientists believed that the liquid water that's on Earth, that's in our oceans, actually originated from volcanoes. What you have is you have this very early Earth, before life, before dinosaurs, before single cellular organisms, you have this hot ball of magma. And on it, there's a lot of volcanic eruptions, volcanic activity. And when volcanoes erupt, they throw a whole bunch of stuff into the atmosphere, into the air. They throw soot and ash and carbon dioxide and oxygen and methane and hydrogen sulfide. But they also throw water vapor into the air. And what scientists believe is that enough volcanic eruptions over a long enough time threw enough liquid water into the air and enough other gases that formed a primitive atmosphere that... What eventually happened was it rained, just like it did today. And enough rain over enough time and the cooling effects of the atmosphere that Earth was developing allowed that liquid water to stay on Earth and not evaporate it as soon as it hits the ground. And all of a sudden, over a long enough time, you get an ocean. That's the volcanic cycling theory. The idea that all of the water in, in the oceans originated from volcanic eruptions and tectonic activity. Now, that was basically the only theory of how water got into the oceans until this next one came up in about the 1980s. This is called the comet theory. And what the comet theory says is that another possible source of water isn't volcanoes. It's, it's actually comets. First, I have to tell you, in order for this to make sense, what the difference between a comet and meteorite is. And that is that a comet is actually a dirty snowball. It's actually an ice ball with some dirt and soot in it. And comets, just like meteorites, which are made out of rock, hit our atmosphere all the time. And when they hit our atmosphere, they burn up. Only comets are ice. So when they burn up, they deposit some liquid water into our atmosphere. What marine scientists and, and some astronomers believe is that enough comet strikes over a long enough period of time could actually contribute to a sizable amount of water in the oceans. And that's kind of the hard part of it to understand and, and agree with, is, is this is a ton of water that we're talking about, so it must be a lot of comet strikes. But believe it or not, if you actually take the amount of comet strikes you see in a year and figure out how much water they're actually depositing to the atmosphere and multiply that out over the entire area of Earth and the entire history of Earth, what you get is, within a margin of error, a substantial amount of water, and that could pretty much contribute to the amount of water that's in the oceans today. What we have now is a problem, because human beings like one answer to one question. But unfortunately, there isn't only one answer to one question. A lot of times in science especially, and in, in marine science especially, there isn't just one answer to one question. There might be a couple of contributing factors that go into answering a question. And this is a perfect example of that. Here we have two theories, the comet theory and the volcanic cycling theory. They're both explaining the same idea, how water got in the oceans. And it's human tendency to want to choose one or the other. Is it volcanoes or is it comets? But the reality is it's probably somewhere in between. It's not one or the other. It's not either or. It's both. So in marine science, we're going to come up with a lot of theories and be confronted with a lot of theories. And is going to be a lot of multiple explanations towards one thing that people have observed. And in those cases, what you have to remember is that when I give you multiple explanations, it's not one or the other. It's actually both or some combination of the two or three or four explanations that most conclusively explains what we're trying to explain. 
Next, we're going to start talking about the oceans today. So now we talked about how water got in them. Let's talk about the oceans today. There are four oceans today. The one up here is known as the Arctic Ocean. There is no Antarctic Ocean. Arctic is north, Antarctic is south, and the reason why there's no Antarctic Ocean is because this Antarctic Ocean would be the meeting places of these other three oceans on Earth. And since there's no clear boundary between where one ocean ends and the other ocean begins down there, there is no general ocean. Sometimes marine scientists will just generalize the meeting of these three oceans down here around Antarctica as the Southern Ocean. But keep in mind, if I ever say the Southern Ocean or you ever read about the Southern Ocean, there, there isn't a Southern Ocean. It's just the meeting place of the last. The Arctic Ocean does have a clear boundary, right? It does go straight around and it's in the North Pole. And there you go, Antarctic Arctic Ocean, excuse me. Next ocean is over here. This is the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is right by India. That's how it got its name. It's right in this area there. Next, we have the largest ocean on Earth, the Pacific Ocean, which is on the west coast of America. The east coast of America is home to the Atlantic Ocean. And if you're in Pennsylvania, which I'm guessing most of you are in because I teach in Pennsylvania, specifically in North Penn High School, you'd be right here on this map. You swim in the Atlantic Ocean unless you go to the West Coast or somewhere else for vacation. I don't know where you go. But when you go to the Jersey Shore in Pennsylvania, you swim in the Atlantic Ocean. In terms of largest and smallest, like I said, the largest and also the deepest ocean on Earth is the Pacific Ocean. The largest and deepest ocean on Earth is the Pacific. Vice versa, the smallest and shallowest ocean on Earth is the Arctic Ocean, the one in the north. A lot of people think it's the Indian. That's actually not true. That's the second smallest. The smallest and shallowest is the Arctic Ocean. Largest and deepest is the Pacific. Next, we're going to talk about how the oceans got there. We're going to start by talking about Pangaea, and you may have already heard about Pangaea, right? Pangaea in third grade or in middle school, whenever you learn about it, this is one gigantic supercontinent that the dinosaurs were roaming around on. It was about 190 million years ago, uh, about 10 million years after plants started evolving. The thing is, everyone's heard of Pangaea, but... If there's one giant supercontinent, that must mean that there's one giant super ocean that surrounds it. And no one ever bothered to tell you guys about that, what that one giant super ocean is called. And now that we're in marine science, you learned about land. Now we have to learn about water. So here's how the oceans evolved. Around that gigantic supercontinent, there was one gigantic super ocean, one gigantic super ocean. And there was also a little hole in the very, very north. Pangea, pan means all, gia means land. Up north, there is a hole, which means sinus, and north means borealis, so sinus borealis, the hole in the north, and that is going to become the ancestor of the Arctic Ocean. The giant ocean that surrounded Pangea is actually called Panthalassa. Remember in Greek, pan means all, so Pangea, all land, Panthalassa, all water. That's going to become the ancestor of the Pacific Ocean. Why is it Sinus Borealis and Panthalassa and not the Arctic and Pacific? Because we don't have the Indian and we don't have the Atlantic. And unless you have all four oceans, you can't have any. Because, there's again, there's no clear boundary between the Indian, Atlantic, and Pacific Oceans in the south. Next, Pangaea is going to start to break up. We still have Panthalassa, we still have Sinus Borealis, but when Panthalassa, when Pangea, Pangea starts breaking up, you start forming a new ocean. Now, why does it start breaking up? It starts breaking up because of this area known as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is a spreading center that actually forced apart Pangaea into its separate continents. And in fact, it's still in the Atlantic Ocean and still spreading apart today, it's just in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. That mid-Atlantic ridge was forming the Atlantic Ocean then, and it's forming it now. It's what's forming the Atlantic Ocean, specifically the North Atlantic here initially, but then also the Southern Atlantic as well. Still at Panthalassa, don't have the Atlantic yet, still a science borealis because we don't have the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is what's going to form when, when Gondwanaland, the southern landmass, breaks up. 
once India breaks away from what was then Antarctica, uh, that's when you get an Indian Ocean, which is when you get an Arctic Ocean and a Atlantic and a Pacific Ocean as well. Now, that's how those oceans formed, the Arctic Ocean being the oldest, the Indian Ocean being the newest. And important thing to remember there, keep in mind, the Arctic Ocean is, is along with uh, uh, Panthalassa, that's the Pacific, but the Arctic Ocean is the smallest and the Pacific is the largest. So oceans don't grow like people. Just because they're big doesn't mean they're old. Arctic is one of the oldest oceans on Earth and it's still the smallest and shallowest. So... That happened, you know, the ocean spread apart, got bigger, got smaller, depending. But is that still happening today? Well, if I take this map that I already showed you and I superimpose all of these plate boundaries that show you the plates that are moving, what you can see is that just like before, you have this mid-Atlantic ridge and just like before, it's forming new Atlantic Ocean. So the Atlantic Ocean is getting bigger. If the Atlantic Ocean is getting bigger, that must mean the Pacific Ocean on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean is getting smaller. More to the point, we were creating oceans back then and we're still creating them now. In the Indian Ocean, you have a spreading center right here. That's near the Red Sea and in about 50 million years, the Red Sea is gonna become the Red Ocean. It's actually a new ocean forming, just like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge formed the Atlantic Ocean 150 million years ago this spreading center is forming what's eventually going to be the Red Ocean uh, in, in a millions and millions of years. So just because the oceans, just because the oceans form doesn't mean they've stopped forming. This entire motion on a whole is happening about the rate at which your, uh, at which your fingernails grow or which your hair grows. So next time you clip your fingernails, just think that's how much closer you are to well, Japan, actually. And in about 200 million years or 300 million years, there is going to be no more Pacific Ocean. The West Coast of America is going to slam right into the East Coast of Asia. And at that point, California will, in fact, have the best in sushi in America. But that's, you know, 150, 200 million years from now. So that's it for the first lesson. We started talking about how water got in the ocean, the comet theory, the volcanic cycling theory, and specifically the idea that you shouldn't choose between them. Just because they're two theories trying to explain the same thing doesn't mean they're both not without merit and they can't both be right. Then we talked about the four oceans today, the Arctic, the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian, how the Arctic is the smallest and shallowest, and the Pacific is the largest and deepest, and how they all formed, Sinus Boralis and Panthalassa, the start of the Arctic and Pacific Oceans, respectively. And then as Pangaea broke up, you get the formations of then the Atlantic and then lastly the Indian Oceans. So that's it for today. Today, uh, tomorrow, and for the next lesson, what we're going to be talking about is uh, once we understand how these plates are moving and where the ocean floor is being created, we have to talk about where that old sea floor is going. I mean, the earth isn't getting any larger. So if, if, if the oceans, some of them are getting bigger, some of them are getting smaller, where is the old sea floor going? Where is the new sea floor being created? And how can you tell just by looking at a map what's happening? So that's the next lesson. But that's it for today. And thanks for listening.